All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Duffy. I'm the CMO of Pixability. I guess we're live. Uh, I wasn't sure. I was I was uh, staring at the camera trying to figure it out. Uh, welcome to our IAB Brand Academy today. Um, I'll be your host. Uh, very excited to talk to you today about um, what agencies, how agencies are approaching YouTube and connected TV in 2021. Uh, I want to first thank our hosts, IAB. They've been great to work with and uh, excited to talk to you all today. Um, if you have any questions for us, please submit them in the Q&A uh, section of the bottom of the screen in the Zoom here, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the session. Um, I'm going to present some results of our survey that we did over media agencies, along with some other uh, points, and then we'll get to questions. Um, and like I said, we'll get to as many as we can, and any that we can't get to, we'll get to after the fact. Uh, so I will share my screen and get going. All right. So as I said, we're gonna today we're gonna talk about how media agencies are approaching YouTube and connected TV in 2021. Uh, a lot of what I'll show will be based on this survey we did earlier in the year of 177 U.S. media agencies. Uh, but we'll also be sharing some some other data we have and some experiences we've had with with agencies and brands um, that we work with. So really quick introduction to Pixability. I, I know some of the folks on the registration list we work with, but for those of you that don't know us, uh, we're a software and services company. Um, we basically power YouTube and connected TV campaigns to uh, improve brand suitability and performance. Uh, three real quick points to know about us. Uh, we've managed more YouTube campaigns than anyone except Google themselves. We don't ever expect to outpace Google. Uh, we're also known as a YouTube data leader. Uh, Google actually hires us for YouTube insights, and we're the one brand suitability provider that YouTube is certified for uh, YouTube content insights. And finally, as YouTube has grown as a connected TV powerhouse, uh, we've also grown into a CTV platform as well. And so we run campaigns across not just YouTube and YouTube TV, but also Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and Hulu. Uh, so that's a quick intro to us. Um, the rest of the session will be all about what, what you all are thinking. So before we talk about 2021 and what everyone's, everyone's thinking today about YouTube and CTV, just, just a quick look back at 2020 and remembering what a crazy year it was for all of us in so many ways. And obviously um, the, the way that it affected us uh, as an ad industry, there is a long list, but one of the strange things that happened was this continued death spiral of, of TV as, as all these headlines uh, speak of. You know, we, we'd talked, we've talked about the death of linear traditional TV for a long time. This year it accelerated and experts say there's no sign that it won't keep Keep, keep declining at a rapid pace. Um, actually in Q1 of 2020, right when the pandemic hit, it was, it was the uh, largest decrease in paid TV subscriptions ever in the US. Um, and also at the same time, as we know, it was the largest increase in streaming viewership. So we all know this, this is not, a, this is not news to any of us. Um, just to quantify a little bit uh, what we saw happen in the last 10 years from eMarketer, you can see the gray line indicating that pay TV sort of peaked around 2015 and since then has been declining. And as I said, uh, this past year saw a steep decline. Meanwhile, ever since 2010, connected TV uh, viewership has risen and is now beyond pay TV. So here we all are in our industry trying to figure out um, whether, whether you're an agency or a brand. I know we have a mix on, on this uh, call. Whether you're an agency or brand, you're trying to figure out how do I how do I move um, advertisers from TV uh, at the right pace? It's not you don't shift them all from TV to CTV. It's it's incremental. But also, how do you even approach CTV? It it feels like a very um, fragmented space that there are hundreds of players, new content players launching at all times. Just a few months ago, you know, Paramount Plus launched and so forth. So how do, how do we all deal with this? Um, do, we, do we need to go to each of those players one by one? How do we, how do we get reach on connected TV? And so that's part of what we'll, we'll address here today. So we all think of it as a very fragmented market, but when you think about the reach, who reaches the most CT viewers, where people are watching CTV, there are really just a small handful of players that represent um, 82 percent of the viewing hours, uh, according to Comscore, uh, and these top five are Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, Prime, and Disney Plus. 
And then the rest of the 18% of viewing hours are represented by sort of this long tail of, of hundreds of other connected TV players. The interesting thing for us is that of these top five um, CTV players in terms of viewing hours, uh, only two of them are ad supported, uh, YouTube and Hulu. So, so for us, we, we don't have anything we can really do with Netflix or Prime or Disney at this stage uh, until they become hybrid or ad supported. So we really need to focus on the ones that are ad supported, meaning YouTube, Hulu, and some of the ones in the long tail that are ad supported. An easier way to view this is the same Comscore data can be broken out where all the ad supported services are on the right hand side of this chart. And you can see that among ad supported CTV players, YouTube actually represents close to half of viewing hours, uh, whereas Hulu represents a, a big chunk as well with 28%. And then the other 30% are all the other long tail services. So, you know, if you're an agency trying to figure out how can I get some of the reach that I'm missing from traditional TV, now that reach is drying up on traditional TV, um, this is one way to look at it is, is YouTube has a big chunk of reach, Hulu has a big chunk of reach, and then all of these other players combined have a big chunk of reach. Um, so with that in mind, we asked people in this survey that I mentioned, where do you think all of these TV dollars are going to flow this, th this year? Where, where do you think people are going to start moving TV dollars? And uh, resoundingly, the agencies responded that they thought, um, most of the agencies thought that YouTube and YouTube on TV screens was going to be the, the number one place where a lot of these dollars were going to start to flow. Uh, Hulu, obviously, being a, a, big, a big target for these dollars, as well as Roku, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, some people still don't think of YouTube as a connected TV player at all. I mean, there's probably people on this call that are saying, why are we talking about YouTube as connected TV? I think of Hulu as connected TV and, and Netflix and so forth, but, but is YouTube really connected TV? And that's why this, this study that we did um, that, that revealed this data point that agencies uh, see YouTube as a good target for um, TV advertisers uh, it was interesting enough that eMarketer said, asked us if they could include it in their report here, which is what, what they've done here. So knowing that YouTube is an important player for reach, um, it's not surprising that when we asked folks, how do you think, we asked agencies, how do you think your clients spend on YouTube will change in, in 2021? Um, most of them said that they were going to increase spend with 21% saying they're going to stay the same and just 1% saying decrease. Not a surprise to anyone. We've seen this not just from our survey, but from all uh, data points that we've seen around the industry. So thinking about what, what I've said, so TV has declined, connected TV has risen. YouTube is an important player in connected TV. How are we, how should we all like make sense of this and, and, and create campaigns that are, that are um, getting both reach and reaching the audience that we want to reach? What are the challenges of YouTube that we have to be aware of um, that are very different from TV and from even some of these other connected TV players? And, and this is where I like to bring up this, this cool metaphor that um, I had a good conversation with Mike Fisher from Essence a few months back. And, and I said, do you even think of YouTube as connected TV? And he said, listen, if people are watching content on a TV screen, that should be a place where marketers want to reach them, period. And he, he gave this great metaphor that I like to use, which is um, 10 years ago, everyone would watch Saturday Night Live on Saturday nights when it was aired on a, on a traditional TV. Eight years ago, people started DVRing Saturday Night Live and then watching it maybe the next day. Then people... You know, four years ago, people would start to watch it on Hulu or another streaming service, uh, service when they were, you know, on demand when they wanted to watch it. Now, more often than not, people are trying to fit SNL into their schedules. And maybe they don't want to watch the whole the whole show, and they're watching clips on on YouTube. Uh, this was echoed by I had a great conversation with Sharice uh, Hughes, the CMO of Kellogg's, uh, a month ago, and she said she said actually the way that she watches YouTube is she. First of all, she watches. Uh, she goes on to watch, look at competitors' ads on YouTube, which is which is something that um, is a fun thing to do. I've done as well. Uh, and the second thing is to watch SNL clips, uh, Michael Che clips. Um, so again, this is this is just to get us in the mindset that while we think of YouTube as user generated content, and there is a lot of user generated content, there's also a lot of premium content. But also, if someone is watching an SNL clip on TV screen. How is that any different than someone watching the whole show on TV screen 
whether it's on a DVR or live TV. So the mindset is shifting. And that's why Mike Fisher said, listen, these are TV viewers. Marketers need to figure out how to reach them. So what are the challenges? Um, how are we going to figure this out? One of the challenges is teams at agencies aren't set up to think of YouTube connected TV and linear, linear TV all as one bucket. Um, we asked in, the, in our survey, we asked agencies, uh, do you have a team that is set up to plan for and, and run campaigns across connected TV, YouTube, and TV all in one team? And only 37% of uh, said that, yes, we have a team like that right now, whereas most of them had those teams split up into two or three different separate teams. Um, the interesting thing is we said, well, how will that be in the near future? And 63% said they would have at least one unified team running all of these things together. Uh, there are many challenges for running all, all three things together that the industry still has to figure out. It's not an easy thing to run all three together because there's apples and orange me measurements. There's tough, it's tough to know deduplication and so forth. The, the point of this uh, data point that I thought was interesting is just the mind shift is that we are starting to think of it as if someone's watching a television screen, I want to reach them no matter what they're watching, as long as it's brand suitable content and so forth. So that gets to, all right, so we know that YouTube's an important player, but what are the things that an agency or a brand struggles with that they need help on? Uh, we basically asked this question of where would you need help? What are the most important benefits that you could get from a third party to help you with YouTube campaigns? And the two, two number one answers were uh, brand safety and ad performance. Not surprisingly, these are the things that agencies care the most about. They don't want their clients ad to appear somewhere unsafe and they want to make sure it performs well. So what the way I'm going to structure the rest of this uh, presentation before I open it up to questions is let's talk about these two things. Let's talk about how agencies are approaching these two things, safety and performance, and, and how you know, we've, seen, we've seen it work and not work for folks. So we'll start with brand safety and suitability on YouTube. Um, interesting to think back, um, YouTube was, was around for about a decade before it really had any brand safety issues, before anyone saw an ad appear on a content that they said, wow, I don't want my ad to appear on content like that. And it was, you know, violent terrorism content that an advertiser, you know, had a screenshot taken of. And then we've seen other instances of that since 2015. When this happened, obviously the industry jumped and said, we need to pull all of our advertising off YouTube. Then YouTube and Google really started to make concerted efforts to, to fix this problem. And they've done a lot since then, um, huge investments in machine learning, hiring thousands and thousands of human reviewers, a lot of steps around uh, children's content. And the thing that's most important to point out to you all, which this graphic represents is um, not everyone, not every channel on YouTube can have ads. And most people know this, but they don't really think of it because they'll go to YouTube and they'll see a, a content piece that just feels like not something they'd ever want a brand to advertise on, but they have to remember that a lot of those aren't ad eligible. So when you look at this big box on the right-hand side, the big gray area of the box are all, is all the content that people can't advertise on. Because of this new, um, it's not new anymore, it's about two years old, but this new rule that to be ad eligible, a channel has to have at least 1,000 subscribers, at least 4,000 watch hours. So this rules out, you know, Someone just starting a channel yesterday, putting a horrible video on it and expecting to have an ad run on it. Uh, the other piece of it is YouTube set this, set this up as three different tiers so that expanded inventory is safe inventory that's a little bit um, more risque, whereas limited inventory has got less scale but is much more um, safe. Uh, so this is, this is what, what YouTube has done. Uh, there's more work to be done, but the good news is a lot of work has been done since 2015 when that those first incidents happened. Um, we work very closely with GARM, and I know most people on the line would know what GARM is, but it's the Global Alliance for Responsible Media. They're part of WFA, and they've done an amazing job of um, creating standards for our industry around safety and suitability. And they recently came out with this great report in April uh, and it's not just about YouTube, it's about Facebook, Twitter, and a bunch of other social platforms that looks at how they're addressing brand safety and suitability, and really what levels of safety and suitability they've reached. 
And the very good news for, for those who want to advertise on YouTube is YouTube has reached basically less than 1% safety error rate for advertisers. So 99 plus percent of the time you advertise on YouTube without doing anything in terms of brand suitability or safety, you're going to be, you're going to be safe. Um, so that's very good news for us. I think there are some advertisers out there that feel like pretty much every other video that they might advertise on might be unsafe for them. Now, this is safety. It's not suitability, which I think there's still, still a lot of confusion and discussion in the industry around. So just to sort of define um, safety and suitability, uh, safety is really, this is content that's not safe for anyone. No advertiser would want to advertise on it. It's not subjective. It's the, this content just should not have ads. And this, they basically, it's defined as any content that contains any of the quote unquote evil 11. Uh, and these are the four A's and GARM uh, framework. And it's adult content, arms and ammunition, crime and harmful acts, hate speech, et cetera. So if it falls into one of these categories, it's just unsafe. And YouTube has done a great job, as I showed, of weeding out this kind of content. Suitability is something that is very subjective, whereas a Rolex might not be comfortable advertising on certain types of um, edgy music videos, but a video game company may. So, so YouTube is extremely safe now, but it, suitability is subjective. So it's very brand specific. And it's something that every advertiser has to think about what suitability means for themselves. Um, I like to use this metaphor. This is also something that, that Rob from Garm, um, the head of Garm uh, shared with me that I loved is that brand suitability is sort of like water filtration. If you think about water filtration, you have a water reservoir somewhere and this, the state or, or government entity that runs that water source has to keep it as safe as they can. Um, and then, but then it still goes to a treatment plant to, to make sure it's safe. And then it gets delivered through these pipes that have to be kept safe. And then it gets to our faucets where we may even add one other layer of safety with with uh, filtration, and then it gets measured to make sure it's safe by, by the government entities again. To, to bring that back to YouTube, it's the same thing. So think of YouTube as sort of the water source and they're doing their best job to keep it as safe as possible. Um, but it still needs to go through these other steps before it's suitable for an advertiser. And the content insight step is sort of like the treatment step where a company, a third party, can look at all the content on YouTube and score it and grade it as for, for how suitable it is for different advertisers. Then the delivery stage is how do we choose which of those content areas are, are the ones that this client should run on? And then during the campaign or final filtration is when you make adjustments and then you measure it. The scary thing is a lot of advertisers are only doing one of these or even none of these. And I'll show some results from the agency survey in a second on this. Um, the thing that YouTube has done to help agencies and brands figure out how to do all this and find the right partners is they set up the YouTube measurement program. Um, you guys should go to, the, I'm sure most of you know about it, but if, if you don't go to the YouTube measurement program website, and what you'll see is you'll see providers that can handle each of these phases in the brand suitability process. Uh, we're happy to be one of them, but there are lots of other great players in the industry that can do these things. Uh, you basically want someone that can handle as many of these steps as possible. Uh, the measurement phase is where companies like Double Verify and IAS handle it. We have great partnerships with them. Um, so go to youtubemeasurementprogram.com and you'll, you'll get a good sense of, of the, the partners that Google has certified to be experts in each of these things. So here's my favorite example of why suitability can change um, in, in a day's time or a minute's time. Uh, before January of this past year, um, Amanda Ensing was a, a beauty influencer on YouTube with a great channel, lots and lots of followers, lots of traffic. She was kind of the ideal place for a beauty brand to advertise. So Sephora found out the hard way that um, sponsoring her and just sort of setting and forgetting it was not a good idea. So they Sephora set up a sponsorship um, on Amanda Ensing's channel with another third party. And in January 6th, Amanda Ensing, after the Capitol riots, tweeted these pro-Capitol riots uh, messages. And um, we, we caught this because of our monitoring. And we immediately removed her from, from being suitable from, for advertisers uh, because we knew that some would be very, this is a very sensitive social issue. And 
but the third party that was running this campaign for Sephora wasn't doing that kind of day-to-day, day-to-day, hour-to-hour monitoring. And so on January 29th, the Sephora sponsorship appeared. And that night, January 29th, folks that were against the Capitol riots on the left were outraged. And they were saying, boycott Sephora. This is crazy that Sephora has advertised on this woman's channel. And she's saying all of these things about how patriotic the Capitol riots were. Sephora, how dare you? And so Sephora panicked and said, oh my gosh, let's pull our sponsorship. This was a big mistake. I wish we had been you know, monitoring this day by day. They pulled their sponsorship. And then people on the right side said, boycott Sephora. So basically Sephora was able to anger both the left and the right of the political spectrum in the course of two days, really through no big fault of their own. They sponsored a beauty influencer that was a great beauty influencer to sponsor. They just didn't have a partner or anyone internally that was monitoring brand suitability day to day. So this is again why that water filtration metaphor makes sense is it's not a let's just measure it at the end or let's just do one thing at one point in the state in the process it's a process that you have to continue throughout or you might miss something like this so let's see what the what the folks the the agencies that we asked um, are doing in terms of pre-campaign brand suitability which is a super important step Um, there were some interesting and somewhat scary results here which is we asked agencies how are you handling pre-campaign brand suitability and 15% aren't doing anything, which is the scary, the scary one. Uh, 39% are using a third party like Pixability and, and the others that I showed in that, that previous slide. 47% are building it on their own. And I know some agencies that are doing this very well. They have uh, big data science teams, big human teams that are managing this, that are focused on YouTube. That can work. Uh, I know a lot of other agencies that are not experts at this, they're trying to do it themselves and it's it's not working. So this is just something for every agency or brand to figure out whether they want to be in the business of being YouTube experts and building this capability or not. But the don't use anything is the scary one for sure. Uh, now, why does this matter so much? Well, we asked agencies, what happens if you don't do brand suitability the right way? Um, what, what do you think would be the impact on your campaigns? How many of your impressions would be off target? In other words, you run a, you're going to run a campaign for a client of yours and you're not, you didn't do brand suitability quite right. How many impressions would be on content that they would not want it to be on? And the average answer was 37% off target, which is again, scary. Um, no client of any of ours would, would want to be 37% off target ever. So, um, this is just a, um, I guess, a message to the industry of why it matters to do it the right way, whether you're doing it yourself or working with someone else, uh, you can, if you mess up, you can have a big chunk of your campaign that's off target. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about performance on YouTube. And what do I mean by performance? Um, there, there are lots of different ways to think about performance on YouTube. Uh, it's traditionally thought of as, as a reach play Um, and not something that's bottom of the funnel, but really there are things you can do on YouTube now from the top to the bottom of the funnel, whether you're looking for reach all the way down to looking for website traffic, conversions, store visits, and even revenue that you can track from your YouTube advertising. Uh, The tricky thing here is if you're running it yourself, uh, there's a lot of measurement, different ways to measure these things, sometimes working with third parties, sometimes setting up pixels, sometimes setting up location extensions, et cetera, that you have to think about. So this is just something to think about for uh, agencies or brands running it themselves. Um, If they want to handle all this, this is where they sometimes call in a third party. And so we asked agencies, similar question that that we asked on the brand suitability side, um, how many of you are working with a third party to help you with this versus doing it yourself? And we saw a greater percentage of these folks working with third parties than, than for brand suitability. Um, basically, 54% of agencies working with a third party on, on running their YouTube campaigns to get better performance. Uh, 22% of those using just third parties, managed service uh, companies, and not doing anything themselves, with 32% doing a combination of managed service and self-service. On the 46% that are doing it themselves, they're either running it on Google ads or DV360 or a combination of both. Um, one of the interesting things that we did in this survey, if, if anyone wants to follow up with us, is we broke all of these results out by 
big agencies versus small indie agencies. And the, and the answers were very different across all of these things based on how big your agency was. And this was a good example where um, bigger agencies were more likely to run TV360 and smaller agencies were more likely to run Google ads. Um, but what we're seeing here is that the folks that are doing self-service are using these native platforms from Google. Uh, Google ads is, is a great platform for very straightforward campaigns on YouTube. Uh, it was built for search and then sort of reconfigured for, for YouTube. So it doesn't have all the flexibility that you really want for a YouTube campaign, but, but it's great for a campaign that might be across YouTube and search all in one campaign. Um, DB360 is more of a, a DSP where you can run, uh, you can run on video and display outside of Google's display network and outside of YouTube and, and Google search. Um, it's more often used if YouTube is not a big piece of what you want to do, but it's just one small piece and you have lots of other pieces that are more important because there, it doesn't have um, maximized functionality for optimizing and so forth on YouTube specifically. It's more of a uh, great place, great way to have consolidated billing, consolidated reporting and so forth. So the challenge for the self-service folks that we've heard is that if YouTube becomes super important to them, they've, they've sometimes run into issues where they wanna start working with a third party, which is why you see sort of the other half of agencies doing that up above. Now, why is this? What is the challenge? Um, what we found at Pixability is we, we were running campaigns on the native platforms ourselves. And we just found that, that, that there was a lot of work that had to be done manually. It wasn't that it wasn't possible to do, but to do very granular targeting breakouts um, it, it's just a very manual thing. So what people end up doing is not having as many granular breakouts because it's, it's manual. So if you really want to know not just how did targeting tactic number one compare to targeting tactic number four, um, but you want to know how it compared based on age, location, and gender of the audience that it reached, then you need to set up in a very much, uh, much broader, more granular way, actually, um, to get those results and to get that performance. So that's one, one challenge that we're seeing agencies have with the native platforms. The other thing that we're seeing that I think is going to become a huge topic for all of us to talk about is contextual targeting in general is sort of the, the big topic these days. A lot of that um, has to do with, with the changes in, in what's going to happen to cookies. Um, what we try to remind people is that that audience targeting on on YouTube is not going to be affected uh, as much as it, as it will be across all of the, of the display and programmatic buying on other platforms that you do. And that to just think of contextual targeting as the end all be all on YouTube is a huge mistake. We see lots of agencies too, too heavily focused on it and lots of third parties talking only about contextual targeting. Uh, what we point out to people, again, is. If you're a sports car company, yes, you can target content based on, you know, keywords, uh, topics and placements of, you know, in this example, the word sports car, and you'll reach people that are interested in that topic. That's great. And you should do that. Um, but you'll, if that's all you do, what you'll be missing is behavioral targeting, where you can target people that search for a sports car on Google or on YouTube, or people that downloaded auto apps or have been to auto websites. Uh, some of those things will be affected by, by the cookie stuff, but the, the Google search stuff will not be affected at all. Uh, or remarketing, people that visited, visited the advertiser's website, et cetera. So the, the best, what we've seen as the best um, way to do it is a combination of these things. And to break it out, like I said, in, in a deep, deep granular way so that you can test each different one of these tactics. You know, there are hundreds of different combinations of tactics, tactics that you can use. So what do the agency folks say about this, about audience targeting versus contextual targeting? What, what happens if you leave out audience targeting? Is that still fine? And, and we were actually surprised with how, um, how intensely they, they worried that without the right audience targeting, you'd be missing your audience. This is similar to the brand suitability question we asked. In this, in this question we asked, if your campaign did not use deep audience targeting, um, how much of your impressions would, would miss the audience you're trying to reach. So in other words, I'll just do contextual targeting. I won't layer any kind of audience targeting on it. And I'm trying to reach, you know, women auto shoppers in these regions. How many of the people in that campaign will reach those things? Well, half, according to, according to these agencies. That was their estimate. Um, so, so this is, again, a scary, uh, a scary warning that 
if you're not doing audience targeting correctly, you're all, you also could, could miss the mark quite a bit and be off target. All right, so that's, um, that's basically the, uh, the, the bulk of the presentation. I'm gonna leave you with some takeaways and then I'd love to take some questions. We're gonna, we're gonna end uh, a little bit early for you all. I don't think any of us like to listen to anyone talk for too long. I don't like to talk for too long and hate not having a discussion with you all. So um, we're gonna end a little bit early, but I'll start with takeaways and then we'll do questions um, and, and open it up to you all. So again, put questions in the Q&A if you haven't already. Uh, so here are the takeaways. So as we said at the beginning, we all know that TV viewership is dwindling. Um, keep in mind that that YouTube and CTV were, are, are you know moving in to take the place. And if you're not becoming an expert on these things, then you're slowly going to be um, out of touch with with reality. The second point is YouTube is a is a big chunk of CTV reach. So include YouTube in any part of a CTV campaign if TV screens are important to you. Uh, the third thing is whether your internal teams are going to be, you decide whether your internal teams are going to, you're going to have a whole team of YouTube performance experts or not, or whether you're going to need a third party for that. Again, some of the bigger agencies can have huge data science teams, huge teams focused just on YouTube. Even some of them, they'll say, hey, you know what, we actually would like to outsource some parts of this. Uh, fourth um, begin thinking about this merging that's happening at agencies of unified teams uh, across TV, CTV, and YouTube. Again, the huge challenge being uh, duplication. You know, you don't know. I've run this on YouTube. How much of this audience on Hulu am I am I already hitting? Uh, that's going to be a challenge for all of us in this industry. However, um, if the teams are all in one place trying to figure out, you're you're in a better better place. It's going to take some time, but that's slowly starting to happen. Uh, and then fifth and finally, um, YouTube has reached a great point in terms of safety. Uh, you still need some help with suitability, whether it's you being very vigilant about it or you working with a third party. So those are the five takeaways. Um, I will, before I open it up to questions, I will just uh, quickly share my email. Um, I'm sure IAB can, can give you my email as well if you don't take this down, but I'm just mduffy at pixability.com. Feel free to email me directly. Happy to share this deck with you uh, directly or share any other thing um, that we can't answer today. Uh, so with that, I will stop the presentation and I will open it up to questions. And I'm inviting my colleague Cam to come on because I know he's been uh, gathering questions from you all out there and he'll He'll throw some questions at me. Like I said, we'll answer what we can, but we're going to try to get out of here around 2.45 East Coast time and let you all go on and get some work done for the next 15 minutes. Um, and then we can follow up with any of you that that um, was questions we didn't answer. So, Cam, what do we got for questions? All right. Thank you, Matt. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we have a lot of great questions here. I'll start with this one. Uh, in the survey you did, what was the general size of the agencies you surveyed? Oh yeah, um, so that's a good one. So I mentioned that we were able to break out results by big agencies for small agencies. So I was excited. We, we actually had half the respondents were from big holding company agencies and half were from indie agencies. So a lot of the agencies we've shared this with, um, if they fall into one of those two categories, they'd like, they like to see it broken out by peer agencies. So indie agencies, we've gone and presented just the indie agency results. Some of them wanted to see both. So, um, so yeah, so that's a good way to look at the data. Like I said, it's very different, very different answers for some of them based on the size of your, your agency. Yeah, definitely. Um, a next question in here is, uh, do you have any examples of brands who have seen some measurable results from CTV campaigns? Yeah, so this is this is one of the challenges in our industry, right? Um, CTV, a lot of CTV players are um, uh, they're non-skip ads. So you get this report back from from a CTV partner that says, yeah, 98 percent viewership of the ads, and for every campaign that you ran, because they're non-skippable, so they're not going to be different from from um, show to show, platform to platform, and so forth. Um, YouTube, YouTube has some really good measurability. Um, and also Amazon Fire and Roku both have great measurability. So we actually worked with Saucony on a great campaign where they ran a TV, TV only, TV screen only campaign across YouTube, 
uh, Roku and Amazon Fire, and they were able to measure not only brand lift, but also um, how it drove sales uh, of, of their new sneaker that they were launching. So that was great. We actually did a, um, we did a good webinar on it. They're, the folks at Saucony and the folks at iProspect did a great job putting this campaign together. L long story short, measurability on CTV is definitely a challenge still, but there are players that can do it well. Uh, YouTube is cool too, because as I, as I said at the beginning, there's non-skips, a lot of non-skips on CTV, but on YouTube, since there's, there's, they're not, they're skippable as well. You can, you can learn like how well certain things perform based on how, how much viewership they got and so forth. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And Matt, maybe you can expand on that. We actually have another question down here that relates to it. How have you seen advertisers use YouTube for more bottom of the funnel results? Yeah, that's actually, uh, I, you're right. I'll go right to that same example. Um, so Saucony was super excited because to be able to run a CTV campaign and be able to see how their ads drove purchases of their shoes um, really was really a cool thing. Um, I think we've run lots of YouTube campaigns and, and I'm sure folks in the, in the audience have as well that track other things. We've done store visit campaigns for companies like Jack in the Box, where you can see how many visits went to their restaurants. Um, we've done website traffic uh, tracking. Again, these are things that a lot of people don't necessarily, don't in, originally think about as YouTube capable things because YouTube is such a reach play, but um, there are some good ways to track bottom of the funnel results. That's a great question. Definitely. All right, and we'll take one more question here. Uh, what are advertisers, what are you hearing from advertisers is the biggest challenge around CTV right now? Yeah. Uh, so we're hearing a lot of things. I mean, we're some of the things I talked about earlier, like we're hearing them saying like, there's so many players in CTV. Like, do I have to go work with Hulu's teams and then go work with these other 12 new channels that just came up? individually can i go to a programmatic provider like what's the best way to handle it that's one challenge i think that the biggest chat we asked this in the survey too actually and the biggest challenge the number one challenge they said was measurability so that gets back to that that other question it sounds like a lot of the same theme of of questions from folks um measurability in ctv i think was number one if i'm remem remembering correctly in our survey of the the biggest issue they run into with ctv campaigns and again that gets back to a lot of the new CTV content platforms, um, it's hard to measure, you know, exactly who you reached, um, what their viewership was, how it was different from others, because it's all going to be non-skip. Uh, that kind of stuff is still a big challenge for all of us. Um, like I said, the other challenge, I don't think this came up in our survey, but the other big challenge is, is uh, duplication uh, across these platforms. That's going to be something we're going to struggle with quite a bit. Um, we have a lot of folks that are trying to move TV dollars to YouTube um, using Reach Planner, Google's Reach Planner as just a, a fuzzy math way to look at, all right, if I move this many dollars from TV to YouTube, um, how's that going to affect the reach of the audience I want and, and the spend? Can I spend the same amount and get higher reach and so forth? Um, so that's, uh, that's a challenge that, that is tough, but um, there are some ways to get around it. So another good question. Great. Awesome. I think we'll wrap up there. Um, but thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Matt, for the great presentation. Um, we'll be following up or IAB will be following up with the recording shortly after this. So keep an eye out. And if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to uh, Matt at the email he had in the deck there, <laughs> mduffy at pixability.com. Yeah. And like I said, we're happy to share the deck. Like Cam said, they're going to share, IAB is going to share the video of this if you feel like listening to me talk for 40 minutes again. Um, but also if you just want the deck or you have questions on the deck where we got our data and so forth, feel free to reach out to me or anyone at Pixability and we're happy to help. So thanks again, everyone for joining. Thanks IAB and uh, hope you all have a great rest of your day.